Welcome to the Docketing Excellence webinar series, which is sponsored by Black Hills IP and the SLW Institute. Black Hills IP is an accurate, efficient, and cost-effective U.S.-based IP docketing and paralegal service provider. The SLW Institute is an educational group created by the Schwegman, Lundberg, and Wissner firm, which aims to provide insightful and useful information to the IP community. For this webinar series, we have pulled together docketing experts and managers from the Schwegman firm, Black Hills IP, and their respective clients and customers to help educate on key docketing challenges and issues and share best practices on how to overcome them. The Docketing Excellence webinar series is free. There are about two webinars per month through May 2017. To see a complete list of webinar topics and to register for future webinars, go to the Webinars tab of the Black Hills IP website, which is www.blackhillsip.com. The webinar that we are presenting today is the fourth in the series. Today's topic is corporate IT, corporate IP departments that outsource prosecution and the options and best practices for docketing in that situation. We have allowed time for questions at the end of the webinar. Questions may be submitted using the Q&A button on the control bar on your screen. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation. That question will be held in the queue until the end of the presentation when we go through questions. The presenters today are myself, Tom Marlowe, Jackie Spratell, Julie Gillespie, and Lisa Young. I'm Ann McCracken, the president of Black Hills IP. I'm a patent attorney with 19 years experience in patent prosecution. I was a partner at the Schwegman firm for 10 years, and I was also a full-time law professor and directed the patent prosecution program at Franklin Pierce Law Center for five years, which is now University of New Hampshire School of Law. Tom, can you introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Sam. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Marlowe. I'm also a patent attorney, uh, currently president of Black Hills IP Renewals uh, and vice president of operations and quality for Black Hills IP. Uh, before that, I was in private practice with the Schweigman firm, prosecuting and analyzing patents. Then for most of my career uh, in-house as head of the global IP department at Fairchild Semiconductor. Thank you. Jackie, can you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Jackie Spratell, and I am the analytics manager at Black Hills IP. Uh, in a former life, I spent uh, several years as in-house patent counsel for Thomson Reuters, uh, dealing with annuities and prosecution and M&A work. Great. Can you introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Anne. Uh, my name is Julie Gillespie, and I'm currently an or international docketing specialist with Black Hills IP. Um, I have about 20, 23 years of experience in IP, both in patents and trademarks, domestic and foreign, and at least half of that time has been working in corporations, uh, managing portfolios, docketing, and doing prosecution. And then the other half of that time I've spent in law firms doing docketing and prosecution. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And Lisa, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Lisa Young. I'm also an international docketing specialist for Black Hills. I have about eight years of IP docketing experience, and 17 years previous to that, I've worked and managed in different annuity services, including CPI, Denemeyer, and CPI Glo CPA Global. Great, thank you. Today we'll be discussing the following topics. Common IP department configurations, requirements for corporate IP docketing that are typically not required for law firms, additional patent data requirements for corporate IP departments, different approaches to patent docketing, and transitioning between those different approaches. Black Hills IP does docketing work for a lot of corporations. 
In setting up docketing processes for those corporations, I've seen many different configurations for corporate IP departments. At a very high level, I would group the different configurations into three categories. The first category, in-house, is one in which all work is handled internally by the corporate IP department, including preparing and prosecuting patent applications. The second category, external prep and process, is one in which all of the IP management is handled internally, but the actual preparation and prosecution of patent applications is handled by outside law firms. This is very common for corporations with large patent portfolios. The third category is a hybrid in which some preparation and prosecution is handled internally and some is handled by outside law firms. The traditional requirements for patent prosecution docketing, regardless of whether it's in an organization that's a law firm or a corporation, are PTO due date docketing, docketing workflows, and prior art tracking. I want to comment on this list briefly. Black Hills is docketing for many different organizations, and one thing that I've learned is that everyone uses the term docketing a little bit differently. Also, the scope of the work handled by different internal docketing departments varies greatly too. So for this webinar, we have broken the term docketing into various items that corporations need to track. The traditional items are PTO due dates, which refers to basically just entering docketing correspondence received from or filed with a patent office into a docketing system and generating corresponding due dates. Docketing workflow refers to tracking non-patent office deadlines and is typically associated with internal deadlines. Some examples of workflow deadlines are due dates for outside counsel to submit drafts or due dates to make continuation divisional decisions, for example. Prior art tracking refers to managing prior art references and includes tracking what has and has not been cited on an IDS for a particular matter. These are some traditional prosecution docketing requirements. Tom, can you talk about additional requirements that corporations may have for tracking patent data? Sure. Uh, inside a corporation, there's varying workflows and types of data that are needed or wanted to achieve various internal or business goals. Um, Taking a look at the list that we have here, gathering data uh, and driving workflow for invention disclosures. We're talking about collection of the disclosures, review, decision making, um, and maintaining the data for decisions down the road. Um, say two years down the road when an office action comes in, it's useful to know why we decided to file a particular application in Japan, for example. Being able to gather and keep that information within a system is useful. Next, uh, overseeing prosecution counsel, whether that's inside or outside, uh, the data um, used for that, uh, as well as uh, managing budgets. Um, next, with respect to annuity tracking, maintaining patent rights um, for the patents that, that have issued. Um, and again, uh, being able to take a look at them with respect to budgets and projecting spend. If you can uh, sense a bit of a trend here around budgeting and spend tracking, uh, there is a theme uh, when it comes to the corporate environment for sure. Um, when it comes to uh, remote access, uh, basically what we're talking about is when there's a system that's being used to docket uh, deadlines or information uh, internally, uh, allowing outside providers, whether that's firms or agents, to update that data um, in the system so that it doesn't have to be done uh, internally at the company uh, is sometimes a feature that is uh, requested by corporations. And I've got to say, I've seen that done with varying levels of success because of the amount of oversight that's necessary uh, across an outside council network. 
Uh, next, uh, with respect to inventor award tracking, we're talking about, uh, and really this is a field that is sometimes easily overlooked, uh, the tracking of awards, um, but it can be very important, uh, both legally and well, for the inventors, of course, it can be important because they're the ones that get the benefit of those inventor awards. Um, payouts, depending on the company and the policy and the country of the inventor or the patent filing, uh, payouts can happen at invention submission, filing, issuance. Sometimes they can vary by product category or product line or by inventor location or subsidiary location. And all these things require, especially when the patent portfolio gets larger, they require data to, to track that and make sure that you're consistent. And finally, the last category here, portfolio management, collecting data uh, in order to have what's needed for reporting. Reporting's a big thing uh, internally at a corporation, um, and the data that's used for the reporting can, can really vary. Um, whether or not these are going to be reports to product lines with respect to the patents associated with their products or the activity of their engineers and inventors, or whether it's reporting up to the C-suite around uh, or, or the board around uh, the, the patent portfolio itself or budgets or spend, um, or even for SEC filings uh, when patent data is used um, in those cases. And the interesting thing with a lot of these corporate patent requirements is that many of these fall outside what we might call traditional deadline docketing. Great, thank you, Tom. Now that we've talked about some of the various types of data that a corporation may need to track, let's discuss the different approaches to patent docketing. We have the word docketing in quotes on this slide because the word means different things to different people. Some people use the term docketing to mean tracking PTO dates, while other people use the term to mean that plus tracking some or all of the additional data that Tom describes. At Black Hills IP, I talk to companies with a variety of approaches to docketing, ranging from just tracking the basic information to tracking a very comprehensive set of deadlines and other data. And there's a wide spectrum of, of approaches including many hybrid approaches that fall somewhere in between basic and comprehensive. Jackie, can you talk about each of these different approaches? Absolutely, thanks, Anne. So the first approach that I'll be discussing is the comprehensive approach. And as the name suggests, this is really where companies want to include everything. Um, but where it's housed and it's centrally located is their docketing system for their overall IP management. So what does that mean? It means it's going to house all of their bibliographic information. So, you know, you might start thinking title, application number, but maybe it's also including inventor names, or as Tom mentioned for inventor awards, location is important. So having those addresses in there, having some art unit or confirmation or any information that's going to help you either report upwards or understand your IP better or even work through a workflow. Um, you're also going to use this docketing system as possibly your document management system as well. So not only are you tracking office actions, but you're tracking if a foreign agent, for example, were to give you some strategies on some claim amendments. Um, that document gets housed in the docketing system and might get put down as an event in your system. So again, for comprehensive, you want to include everything in the system. It is central. It is the place that you go to make the best decision possible. It also could either interact with other systems or if your docketing system is sophisticated enough, we'll also have these workflows built in, but some internal or external workflows as well. Pros and cons of these. Um, I always like to think about the pros being how much you know control or how much do you want uh, your system to have. For a comprehensive one uh, system, you have where 
it'll include all of your systems. You have control over um, the office actions. You have control over seeing how outside counsel is doing if you have that or how an internal process is working. But that's going to have some drawbacks. With a comprehensive system like that, you, it's going to be more expensive. You're going to probably have to invest in a more robust docketing system that might have several different modules for annuities or workflows along with docketing. And in time, you might also have to increase your resources. Um, not everyone has expertise in annuities and in docketing. Um, and in dealing with general, you know, data integrity. So your department might have to grow in order to have, you know, those expectations on that one. If we could flip to the next approach is the basic approach. So we went from kind of one end comprehensive now over to the other extreme of, you know, the basic approach. And this is, you might be a company just starting out. You have some IP, either you acquired it, or you have a few inventions where you're starting to grow and suddenly you need somewhere to manage it. So you're kind of creating almost what's called an asset list. It's gonna have some very basic bibliographic information in here. Here I have about six or seven key pieces of information that I think are important to start with and some status. Um, this is not meant to say, you know, where is it, if it's a pending application, how many office actions. This is purely just to say, here's how many patents we have, here's maybe some ways to do basic reporting for um, how many got filed in a given year, how many were issued in a given year. But this is really where, regardless of where you are now, this is where you want to start. This is the foundation of having this basic concept. Data is incredibly important. If you don't have some of those filing dates and grant dates and the priority information solid, if you try to build on that from an annuities perspective or even those inventor awards that are so important, if you don't have that data integrity, um, you know, everything else kind of starts weakening around it, particularly if you want that to be its central process. So some of the pros of this are you're only tracking the information your department needs or the company as a whole needs. Um, you're not worried about extra things and managing a bunch of different processes. You just have this basic information to report to whoever the shareholders might be. And with that, since you're only tracking certain information, it's a lot more cost effective and easier to maintain that total uh, data integrity. However, and I've personally experienced this uh, when I was in-house, is at some point you realize the basic is just not going to be enough. It was a great starting point. You made sure your foundation was solid, but you realize normally pretty quickly within a couple of years that you're going to need a more um, robust set of workflows and processes and even a more robust docketing system to handle um, other aspects to really value your IP. And that would then lead us on to kind of the next approach, which is our hybrid approach. And this is pretty much where most people, as Anne mentioned, are going to reside. This is somewhere you have a little bit more than basic, um, so you have some of that bibliographic data and you have the status, but maybe, hey, I have a few more pieces of information. Again, I know Tom mentioned, you know, the inventor and the inventor locations. Um, you might also want to have foreign councils, you know, name in there just for quick reference. For example, on Canadian applications, it's always great to have Canadian council there listed there because they have to pay some annuities. So if you're starting to tie annuities in. Really, when you're in the hybrid approach, how I think about this is you're starting to use the docketing system as a tool. It's not central yet, kind of like that comprehensive where you're using it for everything, but you're starting to quickly realize that this is a great place to start storing your information and building you know, on top of this with some key prosecution events. So you wanna monitor where are things in the day-to-day. -day. Prosecution can take a while. Um, that's one of the downfalls on BASIC is all you have the information is it filed and then it issued. Here you might want to keep track of some key events on office actions, restriction requirements, notice of allowances, and, and even issue notifications because that then might start helping you on your internal workflows. Um, 
Again, previously, Tom had mentioned those inventor awards. Great example of that is when there's an issue notification, there might be an award tied to that. And so you guys are now starting to build on this internal workflow and kind of process that. Um, and that really helps on the pros and cons. Um, in a hybrid approach, again, you have, you know, you're still maintaining your data integrity, but you're starting to build enough workflows on there that you maintain control and you're still aware of the events and the data that's happening in your system. The third point on here on the pros and cons, I really find it's about a half a pro and a half a con. Most people think it's a con because it really takes time to develop these internal processes and tools. Um, but I value that is you take the time initially, but once you get those processes set, that's a really good benefit to the company because you possibly have taken something from outside counsel and brought that in and really made sure that you that the department is aware of what's going on and can tweak it if necessary. Now, again, also one of the cons, if you're moving up from a basic system, for example, this might take a few more resources than what you're used to. Um, but this is really critical. Having extra bodies to help you with this is good, but you also want the right people in place because as you keep evolving, you need you know, the right data, the right foundation, and to just keep moving with good resources. And that moves us into how might you transition between the different approaches? Um, uh, so first, why would a corporation even transition? There's a couple lists here, I won't go, or a couple bullet points, I won't go through all of them in depth. I'll pick the two that are kind of near and dear to my heart. One of them is IP growth. Um, started with Thomson Reuters where it was, you know, there was all about the asset listing. Um, very soon we realized that things were growing at an exponential pace and having so much reliance on outside counsel to do that was just not going to be feasible for us in the long term. So what we decided is we were going to pick some key processes and bring it in-house and start monitoring some prosecution events and really start growing it from there. So I would say, you know, it kind of started uh, on one and moved to more of a hybrid approach. Uh, I also mentioned this, and then as the last one on standardizing processes, um, we had this also at Thompson where, you know, you have an example of you have three or four different law firms. Well, it might be their standard practice for an office action that they respond to a resp office action response in three months. Another law firm might try for three months, but they could extend up to four or five months. A way to really help standardize this process is, one, you could bring it in-house and you do the prosecution where you can monitor that it's going to be a three-month response time. Or what you can do is you can have it where um, you have an external process that, or a workflow you put in place that says, no, we need to have this done at the three-month deadline and a way to make sure that the firms are adhering to that. So those are, might be some things on why you might want to start to transition um, from one to another. Some very quick tips for transitioning um, from the basic. So again, you've started here, you have a small list of assets, where do you go? And you feel like you want to get the comprehensive and you want to know everything because the more you know, the better you can act on things. But you want to make sure that you're really planning for the areas where it's going to be most effective for you. A uh, great example might be, um, you know, you don't want to start just from the basic data to suddenly you're going to draft things in-house, you're going to do all the prosecution, you're not set up to docket those events even. So maybe an area is if you eventually want to get to having to do all those things, you start with, let's start docketing some key events. Let's see if the resources that we already have can keep on top of that workflow and eventually just keep moving forward with where you want to go. Tips for transitioning away from comprehensive. And it doesn't have to necessarily be comprehensive, but it's the sense of you're so used to doing everything in-house or the majority of stuff in-house that how do you know what to give up? And it's very similar to the discussion you have from going to basic, and that is figuring out where there's areas where possibly you could you know, cut back or maybe it's not worth your time to invest in that from an in-house perspective. Great example of this might be drafting applications. Uh, for any of you in-house counsel who also do M&A, 
that can suck up a lot of your time. So maybe a great pruning opportunity might be maybe we don't draft the applications, we'll prosecute them um, on that. So that might be an area where you're kind of taking a step back from a fully comprehensive view there. Uh, I do want to mention a lot of the times when people tend to prune or companies, departments tend to prune uh, off the comprehensive or even from a really high hybrid or sophisticated hybrid, budgets always seem to be the main factor. And it definitely is. Um, but you also just want to make sure that if you're transitioning to like less information, you want to make sure that you can still have enough knowledge to act on your IP. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. At this point, I want to invite Julie and Lisa to join Jackie and Tom for our panel discussion. I have some questions for the panel. The audience can also submit questions by using the Q&A button on the control bar on your screen. And you can go ahead and do those now or at any point. My first question for the panel is, which of the approaches that we've described comprehensive, basic, or hybrid, most closely matches the approach to docketing in your previous company and why? Julie, can you start us off? Sure, Anne, thank you. Um, well, in the three corporations that I've worked for in the past, we definitely used the more comprehensive approach. Um, although we used outside counsel and foreign agents for drafting and filing applications and responding to act, office actions and so forth, we did everything else in-house, and the in-house attorneys also expected us to keep track of everything that outside counsel was doing and with every aspect of the application, uh, beginning with the invention disclosure. And also the company, the company's management often wanted information from us, especially with regard to, for example, expenses and product lines, et cetera. So we actually had a member of the docketing team who was involved in the, with the invention disclosure team. And when that member of our docketing team would tell us that, dis, that management's decision was to go forward with a particular application filing, then we would start by setting up that record and it would move forward from there. We tracked everything from awards dates and expenses, um, through to issuance, and we actually did a lot of the pre-exam formality work in-house, gathering the formalities documents, assignments, declarations, power of attorneys, all of that type of thing we did in-house. And we took care of any issues that came up with regard to pre-exam formalities, um, like responding to missing parts notices and so forth. So uh, in our system, all rules-based dates were docketed, what you would call the PTO due date docketing. We, we docketed all that. In addition to all of our work, what you, you would call workflow docketing, um, which is when we were adding doc dates where we were monitoring what outside counsel was doing. Um, and those dates were established by our outside counsel procedures. We also added a lot of status checks for um, our in-house attorneys because they did do some of the prosecution in-house as well. Um, we also tracked uh, pre-issuance dates uh, because we did pre-issuance file reviews before something actually issued. Uh, we paid the issue fees. Um, we also initiated foreign filings in-house, and then we tracked and paid annuities. So we, we tracked everything in the record, um, even if it was, whether it was done in-house or, or by outside counsel. And we also kept up with things like the changes of title, and the bibliographic data was very important throughout the whole process because we had to keep track of inventor data and outside counsel and foreign agent data as well. So it was very, very comprehensive. Thank you. Wow. Lisa, how about you? What's your experience? Um, my experience in the corporate IP legal department I worked in was very similar to Julie's. It was very comprehensive as well. Um, it was the attorneys as well as division managers referred a lot to the docketing for specific information and statistics. We covered everything beginning from the invention disclosure through the prosecution, whether we prosecuted the cases in-house or outside counsel. But even if an outside counsel prosecuted, our attorneys were had their hands involved every step of the way. 
Um, we also were working with annuities and various contracts, licensees, CDAs, et cetera. And all of that was uh, in our comprehensive docketing system. The docketing, the IP actually was also a very strategic tool for the company. They used that information to determine what IP was working and what wasn't, if they wanted to spin off a division or if they wanted to enter a new country and, and compete with their product. Wow. Jackie, was your experience similar or different? Um, I actually had a bit of an opposite experience, um, which I touched upon a little bit, and that is uh, Thompson really started at, I'd say, the basic level with just trying to build together an asset listing off of the several acquisitions that they had done over the years. Um, and then from there, we really made sure we had the data solid because from there we built uh, more of a traditional docketing system moving into the hybrid um, where we put on some docketing dates, started bringing things in-house. Um, so we docketed even though outside counsel was responding to office actions, we still made sure that, again, the deadlines were adhered to. Um, and then we started bringing in more of an internal workflow of invention disclosure, collection, and decision making and then brought on annuities as well. So we really had an experience of moving from basic and pretty quickly um, to a, a hybrid system. Great, Tom, what, what approach did you follow? Yeah, at Fairchild, we had a very hybrid system. <clears throat> All the invention submission process uh, we handled internally. There was a little bit of internally, internal filing, quick provisionals, that kind of thing. But then almost exclusively, we had drafting and prosecution handled outside uh, by our firms across the world. Uh, we would have docketed, or we would docket major activities in prosecution, um, not everything. So we're generally talking about docketing around key spend breakpoints, um, office action responses, uh, notices of allowance, that kind of stuff so that we could uh, trigger um, a revisit and review of the matter. Basically, it was uh, set up to drive um, an internal workflows around spend and quality management. And that, uh, that's how we were set up. Wow, those are, uh, those are all great examples of how the scope of work is uh, handled so differently by internal docketing departments and how much it can vary greatly. Um, before I go to my next question, I'm going to ask the panelists a question that came in from our audience. The question is, what are the best ways to communicate with outside counsel to get the information to be docketed? What challenges have you faced with that? This is Julie. I, I'll jump in and answer that um, to the best that I can. Um, we had a very comprehensive set of procedures for outside counsel. And when they agreed to take on some of our work from, for us, um, we would go over the procedures with them. And we would specify, you know, these are the dates that we're going to dock it internally to track what you're doing. For example, if, a, if an office action is due, in three months, then we'll expect a draft from you in two months, and we will have that date docketed. And if we have not heard from you by that date, then you will be hearing from us. <laughs> and at that point, if we had not heard from them, it was uh, typically left up to the uh, manager of the docketing team um, or the attorney uh, to send um, outside counsel either an email or to pick up the phone and give them a call, depending on the situation. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to add on that? This is Lisa. Um, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead, please. But we just had a very similar situation. We would we had a protocol set up, and when we any hired any outside counsel from the beginning, we would list our requirements, and we just ensured that they all were adhered to. I, I want to add to that from a more operations level. What I often see when I'm working with new companies to set up processes is um, oftentimes the corporation will have a central uh, email 
uh, mailbox that they have outside counsel report everything to, and then they process the uh, docketing out of that mailbox. Another practice that's very good practice and I highly recommend is to have a joint customer number set up with your outside counsel so that you can go in and have direct access to the matters that they're handling in pair um, as well and you don't have to wait for them to report something to you. And we actually have had uh, instances where companies have come to us at Black Hills IP because they've had probably the challenges that this person is facing where outside counsel is often very slow to report things to them and just asked us to manage that process by accessing the docketing directly through their joint customer number and pair and updating their docketing system. So those are some of the things at a more logistics level that I've seen on that as well. That's a, that's a great question and I think that's a common problem that corporations struggle with. Um, let me go to my next question for the panelists. What unique docketing requirements or practices did your company have and how did you handle them? Uh, Julie, Jackie, I can hand. Oh. oh, sorry. That's okay. I was just, I was going to go over Julie for a second. Okay. Um, so we have uh, at Thompson, what we did was we had certain requirements very similar to what Julie was mentioning about, you know, we had certain timelines that outside counsel had to form um, and to follow. So, for example, again, the three-month deadline, we told them we wanted to adhere to that and we were monitoring on those items, as well as if they needed to file an application, we would say, yep, by the time we give it to you, there's a one-week deadline on that. So, a lot of the times for corporations, they have some guidelines that need to be followed um, and that all the firms need to kind of adhere to those guidelines. As, as far as, um, yeah, as far as our unique docketing requirements, um, we didn't really have anything that I would consider all that unique other than what I've already mentioned with outside counsel procedures and everybody being very, very familiar with those procedures and the dates that were, that were in there that we had to add to our docket. Other than that, it was, uh, I wouldn't say that there was anything unique about it. Okay. Thank you. Lisa? The only thing I can think of really is um, when I was docketing information, we had unique naming conventions for each piece of type of documentation. We also granted access to some outside counsel in a limited way to our docketing system as well as our electronic management system where we stored all the documents. So if they were looking in the computer, they would be able to see in remarks what documents were received on a certain day and were able to retrieve those same documents if they needed to analyze anything. So Lisa, those naming conventions, were those because you connected your docketing system to other internal systems or uh, what was the, the reason for the naming conventions? It was more to standardize. Before I started docketing for the IP department, there the docketing was done by individual paralegals and it was all mm. over the place. Um, so that was part of the standardization and we filed, we were a paperless office and everything was filed in Hummingbird DM, if you're familiar with that. And mm -hmm. that system also was accessible by some outside counsel and other managers from other departments of the company. Okay. Um, Tom, how about you? Uh, what unique requirements or practices did you have to handle? Yeah, two, two things I can think of offhand. Uh, one is uh, locations with respect to inventors and the invention itself. Uh, as we've talked about a little bit, um, that's uh, with res used for awards. Um, we had inventors in um, locations like uh, Japan and Germany and China and India where there are award implications, um, as well as uh, filing uh, implications uh, for where in, uh, a patent application needs to be filed first. Uh, the US, China, and India are perfect examples of that, um, where you need to be uh, keep in mind the location of the invention or the inventor uh, in order to make sure that you're compliant with the laws of those countries. 
Um, in some cases, uh, it, non-compliance can have uh, criminal uh, consequences, <laughs> which we always wanted to avoid uh, with respect to mm -hmm. our inventors. Uh, the wow. other thing, yeah, uh, we never had to worry about that, but uh, I think. Uh, the other piece is uh, that we like to monitor was with respect to response timing uh, for out outside counsel as a way to, to manage and oversee how our outside counsel were doing. Yeah, so those are great examples of data, right? Things that we wouldn't typically think of uh, as the traditional docketing, but yet data that was very important to managing the, the IT department that you were in. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for those. Okay, another question for the panel is, did your company do the docketing um, with internal staff, or did you have outside law firms come in and update your docketing system, or did you use an outside vendor to do the work? And uh, Julie, I'll start with you. Holy cow, you guys had a lot of stuff that you tracked, so how did, they, <laughs> how did you do that? We sure did. Um, we did everything internally, even though I know that our outside counsel also tracked uh, the the patent due dates, the rules-based due dates, and whatever else that they wanted to track on their own. Um, even though they did that, and we know that they, we knew that they did did that. We also tracked everything internally, not only the rules-based dates, but all of our internal dates as well, um, including we had a lot of status checks um, because of workflows and, and things like that. Um, we, the, in the whole time that I was there, we never used an outside vendor except to pay annuities. At one point, we switched to an annuities vendor. But other than that, everything was done internally. And I know, I know that after I left, they actually did switch to an outside vendor, but uh, I'm not sure how that went for them. So I can imagine it was a big headache to switch over. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lisa, how about you? Um, it was just myself, one docketing person. Everything was done internally. Uh, I also had the staff of paralegals, and they all would take on some aspect of it. They would run their own dockets and go to meetings and come back and basically drop off the dockets, and I would keep track of all of those updates in the system. Um, but going back to that earlier question about um, any ideas for outside counsel, um, Another, I, when you talked about the centralized email address, that was one something that we also required that when they send any communication to the IP docketing department, they could address the attorney or paralegal they were working with directly, but they needed to CC the docketing email address. So I basically saw every piece of correspondence that came through the office and I would track it in some form or fashion in the docketing system. That, and that's thanks for adding to that uh, other question. I appreciate that, Julie. That's or Lisa. That's good. Um, Jackie, how about you? Yeah. So for Thompson, um, we we always pretty much had internal staff docketing when we docketed. But um, when we were back on the basic, we definitely had outside law firms keeping track of those prosecution deadlines and when things were due for us. And then we started transitioning to we have the proper internal staff to start kind of um, creating a repeat docket of some key office actions. And then when we started doing things in house, then we were more confident that we could docket, you know, the key events. We weren't docketing everything, just pieces where we needed to respond on that. So majority internal staff um, while we were transitioning to that hybrid approach. And Tom, how about you? Tom, were you working with internal staff to do docketing or outside law firms or outside vendor? Yeah, we would we would do a little bit of uh, docketing work internally, uh, but then the majority uh, of our docketing was handled by an outside service provider. And in this case, Black Hills IP was who we used. Uh, and the reason that we did that was to take the, uh, we had a smaller group. Uh, we had a team of of 11 folks managing 5,000 plus matters. Um, and uh, we wanted to use uh, Black Hills 
an outside provider to do our docketing because it allowed us to take that administrative time burden off of our internal staff and allowed me to utilize those folks um, for more corporate value-added work like reporting, uh, supporting product lines, working with inventors. Um, it, uh, it ended up working out great uh, because it allowed us to provide more services and support internally um, and uh, continue work to get IP more integrated with our technology development while putting that uh, um, uh, the administrative work uh, outside of, of uh, the company. Sure. I have another question from the audience. It's a little off topic, but I think it's uh, worth bringing up here, and I'm going to try to summarize it. The audience member says several panelists are suggesting that companies benefit from dictating deadlines for drafts from outside counsel. As outside counsel, this can be very frustrating if then the internal um, corporate department waits until the very last day to get back to outside counsel and has extensive revisions that are due and that in, as a result can increase costs for the company. So um, from a docketing standpoint, um, is there anything that can be done to have better teamwork between the in-house team and the outside counsel when there is a more comprehensive approach where some of these internal workflow deadlines are uh, dictated as part of the process to make it so it works successfully for both um, the in-house corporate department and the outside counsel? And Tom and Jackie, I think I'm gonna start with you two on this one because you guys have been in both both sides, you know, we've all been outside counsel as well. Yeah. Tom, yeah, I've dealt with this. Do you want me to grab it real quick? And you go can ahead, add? go ahead, sure. Okay, so uh, part of one of the struggles that we had when we were um, kind of going from the approaches and outside counsel and, and having them draft some things and saying we want it by this deadline and yes, we would get things back to you in a very, right before the deadline. Um, Outside counsel came to us and was actually quite frank with us in a very polite way on saying, you know, if you get it to us by this deadline, here's the cost. If you get it to us two days before we need to file it, it's going to be this cost. Um, and for us, that was quite an eye opener. So we built it into our internal workflows and processes that, yes, we gave you a deadline maybe two weeks before the PTO deadline um, and then said, yeah, we're going to get it back to you within the week. So we essentially worked with outside counsel to work on our internal workflow and of the partial external workflow to make sure that that was um, a good balance between the two. Um, particularly if you mention the budgetary constraints, that always gets corporate's attention pretty quickly. <laughs> Tom, anything to add to that? Yeah, and it, th this is a great question because uh, because um, it's it's definitely an issue uh, <laughs> that is dealt with having having dealt with it on both sides uh, of the fence. Um, and the, the reason it happens is because the corporate IP department um, can say boss around, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, the outside counsel that's doing work for them. But a lot of times they have a lot less control over uh, the inventors uh, internally, even though they are internal folks. You know, but there's no reporting uh, between the engineers uh, who, who are doing the inventing and the uh, the corporate IP department. So it sometimes becomes difficult to uh, to get quick turnaround uh, compliance, uh, especially if there's um, you know a major product development that's going on and customers are waiting. Uh, you can imagine what prioritization looks like uh, within a product line. So what uh what we've what i've seen work uh in in various areas is to have some internal uh docketing for the company that includes uh deadlines uh for getting back on on drafts and generally what the, who those deadlines are set for are for folks on the internal uh, ip team 
uh, whether that be patent engineers or paralegals or doctors, to follow up with the inventors and and badger them <laughs> and try and work with them to to help get uh, responses and, and keep it keep it basically on their plate because for for a lot of inventors and engineers um, dealing with patents uh, isn't their day job um, they've got a lot of other things going on so it helps if there's someone else there to remind them when there are when there are deadlines. Good. Well, I think those are, are great tips to make it a more successful relationship between the outside council and the, the internal uh, corporate IT department. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to thank Tom and Jackie and Julie and Lisa for their contributions today. We really appreciate that. And I also want to remind the audience that the next webinar in our series is on November 16th at 1 p.m. Central. The topic is docket cross-off vulnerabilities and best practices. So how do you take off dates from your docket uh, correctly and carefully and without error? To register, I'm sorry, to register for this webinar, go to the Black Hills IP website, to our website, and thank you everyone for participating today. We hope you will join us for this and other webinars in the Docketing Excellence webinar series. Thank you. <laughs>